Portfolio Builder members, welcome to our Friday Trade Alert where we trade the SPY ETF. The big news is that President Trump has a bill on his desk to, uh, to sign a pro-Hong Kong bill that would have the government evaluate their special status every so often. And China is outraged from the Global Times. Here's what's at risk for the U.S. if real Donald Trump signs the Hong Kong bill, making it a law, as Hong Kong government pointed out, $33 billion in trade surplus and cooperation from the Hong Kong government. Uh, plus, we have China tweeting every five seconds about this. They are outraged. And so we'll see if we... Uh, if he signs it or not, it looks like there's plenty of votes in the Senate to, uh, to pass that bill, even if he does veto it. So it may not make a difference. I'm guessing he doesn't talk about it today on Fox Business, or rather just Fox and Friends this morning. He was saying that they're super close to a Hong Kong deal. He's been tweeting that every hour, trying to keep the market up. Um, but it's, it's very questionable if we really have a China deal or if they're just trying to drag this on. <clears throat> now, they did invite our trade representatives to fly out to Beijing, but they've not commented yet if they will fly over there. Uh, regardless, here's our trade alert today. Uh, the price has gone in our favor considerably since we issued the trade, uh, but the alert still has basically the same risk-to-reward ratio. When I jumped in, it was more like 70 risk to 120 potential profit, and so we're currently up 30 bucks on that. Uh, however, you're now up an extra 30 bucks on the SPY from when I entered the trade, so we're still getting the same result, and the trade alert's still good. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what we do. We'll jump in today's trade alert and then jump into the content I've collected over the past 24 hours. Okay, our goal is to generate 1% a month and protect capital. Trade allocation per $75,000 is 100 shares of the SPY, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <coughs> 200 shares of emerging markets on Tuesday. 200 shares of TLT, that's your 20-year Treasury Bond ETF, on Thursday and then 200 shares of GDX on Thursday as well. So this is a highly uncorrelated portfolio that weatherproofs your nest egg and makes it extremely difficult to lose money. You add on our option callers and it's bulletproof. Now, we've only had one losing month in the past 12 months and the maximum drawdown was only 1%. Our average return is 1.35. And over a 90-day stretch, we've never lost money. So if you love to have safe returns with low risk, that's who tends to join our program. And really, where we shine is when the market sells off. In terms of stocks, we generate consistent profits. And so if you tell me you've got a 20% return this year, I will ask you, what's your maximum drawdown to achieve that return? Because it's not just your total return that matters, it's how much risk you took to achieve that return. And so if you're just buying and holding stocks, uh, it's been a magnificent 11 years, but you gotta be questioning how much higher it can go and how much volatility you're willing to take before you start playing it safe. So just back in last December, you held on to 14 to 18% volatility uh, just in the month of December, that doesn't even go back to November and October when the sell-off began. In May, the stock market sold off 7%. We pulled in with a 2.2% return. In August, when Trump surprised everyone, after telling us in July we had a trade deal, which I was betting against, he came out in August, surprised us all, including myself, said we have no trade deal, we're going to raise tariffs. Market fell another 6%. Well, our portfolio generated 0.8%. Now, so far, the tariffs have been tiny and hasn't really impacted the markets. But now he's threatening to really increase tariffs if we don't sign a phase one deal. So this could get quite rough very soon. And Ray Dalio just put a 
$1.5 billion bet that the stock market crashes by April. Now, to be fair, he has a 1.5, or rather a $144 billion fund, so it's about 1% of his assets. But it does show you uh, that everyone's becoming concerned. <clears throat> Our simple four ETF portfolio is extremely diversified and all you'll need for retirement. Income and safety, not growth or speculation. You can simplify your holdings, reduce your risk, get better results with less work, and weatherproof your retirement portfolio. And YouTubers, you can get one free month into our $10,000 boot camp when you join today. So call Dean to reserve your spot at 505-322-7515. We have over 155 members now. We're growing quickly, and it's mostly uh, large portfolios who are joining up left and right. They love our returns. They love what we've delivered, and they love the downside protection we can bring your portfolio. And I may have time today to look at a little bit of what's inside our uh, $10,000 boot camp and specifically how we can deal with the three main trade setups we have in the market today. We have up in the air, which is where we're currently at. Uh, this is where we don't know. Are we going to have a trade deal or not? We have conflicting information. So in this setup, I like to be long stocks and bonds and relatively tight in my option collar on the GDX. I'm also paying a premium for downside protection on both equities and bonds and selling a pretty far out of the money call option because my expectation is it's going to break one direction or the other. Either we get a trade deal and stocks fly up and most likely the bond market has another hissy fit just like it did when we announced phase one deal or it's going to break down and in that case equities are going to crash and the TLT and GDX will soar higher. So we want to have premium downside protection when the trade war is up in the air. But on the other side, we don't want to cut ourselves short on whichever asset's going to jump. So we've been stuck in this up in the air uh, setting for quite some time. One day we have a trade deal, one day we don't. It looks good, it looks bad. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen. If I had to bet money on it, I would say eventually the trade deal breaks down and we don't get a phase one deal. Now, I'm not saying that Trump doesn't want a phase one deal. I just don't think the Chinese are going to give him that. In fact, I think they're going to drag this on as long as they can until he finally loses his temper and raises the tariffs. Why? Because they know if he raises the tariffs, it increases the chances of a recession in the United States, a down stock market, more pessimism from spending from companies, and they can also control the, the slowdown in their economy and try to push the U.S. into a recession. No U.S. president has won the second term when the economy was in a recession. So the Chinese know this. Trump knows this. That's why he's being so careful. That's why he's saying he stands with President Xi and Hong Kong and continues to tell us that we're so close to a trade deal. Now, if the trade war escalates, we'll be ready to flip our option caller to profit from the SPY and emerging markets pulling back. And we're already positioned to capture huge profits uh, with around half of our total portfolio in the bond and gold market. Now, on the other side, if the trade war were to de-escalate and we did get a phase one deal, we would want to use the inverted option caller on the TLT and GDX for a short period of time and then be long on the SPY and emerging markets. And so this is just a quick review of the three trade setups we can use to own the asset, be the landlord, take advantage of selling covered calls to finance our downside protection. And in some cases, actually try to generate a profit from selling call options. So this is our bullish stance, which we are not using right now. We played this for quite a while on the SPY expecting it to get towards the 315 level on hopes of a trade deal. We hit 314, so quite close to my prediction, uh, but now things are quite uh, turning sour very quickly. So uh, we've switched on the SPY in recent trades to this setup, and this was while there was still good hope. In this setup, the market can go flat, and we still end up with a $100 profit 
per share. Uh, but on the same breath, we still have ample downside protection, so our maximum loss is only a dollar. And finally, when we do want to bet down on the asset, we still want to own it. We sell the in-the-money call option for a huge premium, and then we can turn around and buy an in-the-money put. So this is really the only safe way to consistently generate profits betting down on an asset. Think about it. If you just go buy a put option and you're wrong, you're going to lose 100% of that put option very quickly. With this setup, we have the potential to generate with a large percentage of our capital around a 0.66% profit every 48 hours on the total investment to the downside while only risking 0.3%. So it's a much more intelligent way to generate profits to the downside than just outright buying put options. Okay, so those are three setups and how I intend to play the trade war. Right now we're stuck in this up in the air situation where it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. So we're playing it very safe. We're paying ample premium for put options right below all four assets. And then we're giving ourselves some room in terms of one of these assets popping up. Either bonds and gold will pop up on an escalation in fear, or equities will pop up from a trade one, a phase one trade deal actually being accomplished. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual trade trade alert document today. <clears throat> okay, so we've been on a winning streak in the SPY, but we finally had a little pullback. We were entering this trade at 311.73 on Wednesday. And when I closed it out, we were at 310.34. Now, currently, we're up a little bit more than that. Just keep in mind, if I get a little bit less on the SPY, I'll get a little bit more on the, the next trade from the option caller. And on your side, you'll end up with a little more on the SPY profit, but a little less on the next trade. So if, if the price changes 10, 20 cents, it's not going to change our total return from mine versus yours. So just keep that in mind. The market's very fair. Every penny the SPY goes up, is uh, for a one-to-one -one ratio reflected into the option caller. Now, the option caller we purchased was a very expensive 312 put. You can see I actually bought an in-the-money put last Wednesday because I was skeptical that this rally had any more steam. Um, and so we paid 87 cents for the option caller, and we're able to get back $1.68 today. So substantial profit on that and generated a overall loss of only 58 cents per share or a thousand one hundred two dollar loss. Now I want to keep in mind that yesterday while the TLT sold off, the, while the SPY sold off, the TLT popped up higher and our net profit per share yesterday on the TLT was a dollar twenty seven on twice as many shares as the SPY. So we have a two to one ratio of the TLT to the SPY, and that's because the TLT is worth about half the cost of one SPY share. Also, uh, we're up another 19 cents from yesterday on the TLT, so if you double that, uh, that's about 38 cents. So if you take the net net just between the TLT and the SPY, uh, we're only down about 18 cents from yesterday today if you don't even include the big profit we generated on the TLT. So overall, our portfolio has climbed today uh, versus yesterday. Also, the SPY has been on quite a winning streak. You can go look at all the different profits we generated, uh, but it's been a very high probability, high win rate for us as we were able to predict a big move in the SPY on this phase one trade deal hope. Uh, but that hope is fading quickly. Uh, emerging markets is down 19 cents a share from Tuesday or down 722. TLT is up 19 cents a share, up 722 from yesterday. And there's a crackdown happening in China right now. They're having problems with everybody trying to ditch their local currency and convert it into Bitcoin and gold, as well as to go set up corporations in Japan. And so anything they can do to get their money out of China, they're trying to do at rapid pace. And the Chinese are trying to crack down on that. So we have seen a pretty vicious sell-off in crypto. Probably a great opportunity to buy the dip 
uh, and a little bit of a sell-off in the gold miners today, which is unusual because usually gold and the bond market will travel relatively close together. The difference, at least at this point in time, is that gold needs a lot more fear for a big move uh, relative to the TLT. Uh, long term, these are both great buy and holds until the Fed gets to the effective lower bound of 0% interest rates. Um, okay, so let's move along. We're still down 0.2% in November. Again, when we're in this up in the air mode, it's very hard to deliver profits safely because you start to guess whether you have a trade deal or you don't have a trade deal. And at that point, you're just, you might as well be playing uh, roulette, black and red. That's not our strategy. We're positioned very safely, so it's very hard for us to have a loss. But soon as one, of, one or the other outcome does appear, our profit will be realized at that point. So that's really what I'm positioned for. I'm not trying to guess whether uh, which situation's going to occur. We're really positioned for either to happen and we'll have a, a very handsome profit. The SPY program is up 1.2% in November and 1% in October. And again, is all in on the, the SPY. 1,900 shares in our model portfolio. And again, we have twice as many shares of the TLT. That's how you really balance your return and get a very safe, consistent return with low volatility. The emerging markets portfolio had a nice return in October, uh, but has really been dragging in November. So this is primarily China and all of its trading partners. And this lag of the emerging markets against the SPY is certainly alarming. And it tells me that there's pessimism in emerging markets about a phase one trade deal actually happening. Also, we're seeing the SPY gap open each day, not trade up during the trading day. And it's doing this on volume that's extremely low, more like summertime volume on a half trading day. Uh, so that's not a healthy way for the SPY to appreciate. And quite often you'll find that the market will jump back down and fill in these missed prices during actively traded uh, hours. The bond portfolio is continuing to uh, reduce its loss. I wish I had put in some more expensive put options in October and November, uh, but at that point we, we did have a little bit of a sell-off in the TLT that we were somewhat protected, but not completely. So we went from making 2.7% in August, 38 in September, this is on fears of a trade deal breaking down. And then surprise, we got the phase one trade deal announcement in October and did have some, uh, some pretty serious sell-offs in the TLT. In fact, it was a 99th percentile. Our put option did kick in and dramatically reduce those losses, uh, but clearly not completely. Metals market is down a little bit, 1.6% uh, in November, flat in October. And this is after having some substantial gains all year from February through June. And so basically, uh, in the metals portfolio, I want to be long metals if we're cutting rates, which we've done, if we're purchasing uh, bonds, which we've done at record pace, although the print yesterday on the Fed's balance sheet did tick down a little bit, uh, which may be part of the scare in the gold market. Uh, but in the long run, we know they're committed to $60 billion a month added to the balance sheet until the second quarter of 2020 at the earliest. So uh, the only last ingredient to get a big pop in the gold market will be a little extra fear. If we scroll a little bit lower, we can see the previous trade. If you took Wednesday's trade, here's how to close it out. Buy to close the November 22nd 314 call and then sell to close your 312 put. The second step which you can skip to if you didn't take the last trade, is to sell to open the 312 call and to buy the 310 put. Now do note, we're only collecting about 16 cents from selling the call option, which is not a whole lot relative to the 63 cents we're investing in the put option. And that's because I think if we get some good trade news hope, uh, which Trump and our administration loves to feed the market, I do think we can still trade near that 315 level until it's absolutely certain the trade deal breaks down. Now, the longer this persists, the more uh, weight there will be pushing the SPY back towards that 300 level. So we're still carefully trading the SPY 
uh, with the anticipation that uh, they'll drag this on probably past Thanksgiving with the whole trade hope uh, before we could risk any major escalation. Um, so that's what I'm expecting at this point from, uh, from Trump. And I think China's move is to just make this all happen in slow motion as much as possible and to drag it into uh, 2020 because they prefer this to escalate as near as to the election as possible. Okay, moving into the topical news. <clears throat> Bloomberg is getting very vocal, uh, anti-Trump, as he has now put in his card to run for president. Now is a good time to start worrying about China-U.S. trade deal. No, nothing as bad has happened yet. There has, in fact, been many signs of progress, but that's the problem. Also, a lot of the violence we've seen in Hong Kong is happening over the weekend. So we'll see what kind of drama unfolds this weekend. Uh, Bitcoin's below 7,000. This is most likely a great buying opportunity. We have a maximum of 2% of our portfolio uh, falling cryptocurrencies and 1% in Bitcoin and 1% in Ethereum at this point in time. Uh, U U.S. President Trump declines to say if he'll sign the Hong Kong bill. Japan's PMI is still in negative territory, signaling weakness in the future. From the Department of State, China has one of the most active online populations in the world with more than 800 million internet users. But everything Chinese citizens see online is restricted and controlled by the Chinese government's oppressive censorship of the internet. They're not going to like that one. Australian manufacturing PMI is below 50, signaling a slowdown in growth. Trump, we have to stand with Hong Kong, but I'm also standing with President Xi. And so he was on Fox this morning saying that he's the reason why the million uh, militant Chinese army standing at the border haven't come in and caused a massacre. Of course, right away, uh, the Chinese communist Twitter handle was out upset about that as well. And he continues to say the deal is very close. Meanwhile, the Euro PMI is on the border of going below 50, and a lot of people are pulling up the Sweden PMI, which tends to uh, be very correlated with the two-month lead. So that's signaling a major slowdown. Christine Lagarde did her first speech today. Everybody's expecting her to be extremely dovish. Uh, so we're, we're all watching how low, how negative can the interest rates in Europe and Germany go, because that'll give us an idea of how low American yields will go uh, before the bond market runs out of rope. Meanwhile, we are seeing some signs of China uh, increasing its credit impulse, which will be very important for being long emerging markets. And again, if they wanted to create a world recession, I think they could do that just by not increasing their credit and debt right now and trying to restructure all the bad investments they've made. Now, the bad sign for that is that could result in much lower wages for this huge population that's going to have very little to do as people are taking their companies and demand out of China. Um, so a tough call on this to see how much pain they're willing to take to put the pressure on Trump. U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee knew Xinjiang was going to be a humanitarian nightmare when they saw the crematoriums being built at the re-education sites. There's no difference between the CCP and the Chinese invaders. Genocidal policy of CCP against the Uggers to feed both stomach and nationalism mind of the Chinese invaders. The bottom line on this is that there's a group of Muslims in this city who have been protesting uh, for years. And the Communist Party hates it. And that's why they've started creating these uh, re-education camps, which we know exist. We've actually had... Uh, BBC go in there and document videos of them, and uh, it's very scary. Also, we have satellite footage of uh, you know them rearranging things, putting up fake basketball courts, trying to make it look fun, uh, and then you know right after it turns out it was just uh, fake. Stealing agriculture and weather IP must be done given the amount of people they have to feed internally. I'm sure they justify it as a matter of national security. And Chinese national who worked at Monsanto indicted 
on economic espionage charges. Millions of Uyghurs that are currently in concentration camps due to their religious preference, and really more because they are very anti-China and are trying to rebel, aren't coming home. Watch this chilling video of a Chinese opportunist preying on the ethnic genocide in Xinjiang. Cultural, culturally, they have a few screws loose. And so basically he's advertising in this video that the, the neighborhood is just desolate now. No one is there. Come move in. Uh, now here's someone, I'm not sure who he is, but he's very pro-China. Tom Fowdy, the Chinese communist Twitter <clears throat> handle I follow, was retweeting a lot of his tweets last night. The United States has actually no legal right to force Hong Kong to come into compliance with provisions on Iran, North Korea... Uh, because Hong Kong's foreign policy is legally overseen by Beijing. It's like saying China, China supports an act on Californian independence. The U.S. enacting such an act is blatantly interference. Also, given that the basic law, this is the Chinese communist basic law, stipulates that Hong Kong's foreign policy is legally and rightfully overseen by the China PRC, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, by demanding the city come into compliance with U.S. foreign policy goals, is itself violating the basic law. Meanwhile, China has already 870,000 5G subscribers and 1,103,000 5G base stations as expected by the end of 2019. China is expected to become the world's largest 5G market by 2025. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we're seeing Bill Gates and Microsoft having a lot of involvement with China. When Bill Gates tried to build an experimental nuclear reactor in China, his plan was thwarted by U.S. foreign investment restrictions. He says that's a five-year setback for technology. This tells us the reality of the U.S.-China tech decoupling is not truly possible in practice. Silicon Valley will not accept it, and Washington cannot do so without imposing severe costs on their own companies. Thus, it is forced to live with Huawei, albeit in a regulated way. It was never realistic for the United States to completely ban Huawei. The backlash from the tech sector against it was huge. They aggressively lobbied the White House, whilst big names, future figures such as Bill Gates, denounced it. Expert, the bill is a Trojan horse for the U.S. foreign policy goals. Hashtag Hong Kong from CGTN. Meanwhile, we've got our naval furious China shadows two U.S. warships sailing through the disputed South China Sea. And a Malaysian immigration department raids the largest online scam syndicate believed to be run by Chinese nationals. 1,000 were arrested. China wants to work out an initial trade agreement with U.S. and has been trying to avoid a trade war, but it's not afraid to retaliate when necessary. President Xi, we want to work for a phase one agreement on the basis of mutual respect and equality. When necessary, we will fight back, but we have been working actively to try not to have a trade war. We did not initiate this trade war, and this is not something we want. Now, Trump did comment on this specifically, saying that it wasn't fair to start with, so it can't be a mutually even deal that we're going to sign. Phase one trade deal may not get signed before additional tariffs kick in. The embassy spokesperson remarks on 19th of November, cons grave concern and strong opposition to British government's recent repeated wrong remarks regarding Hong Kong. So again, I think if we do get some major violence and more bloodshed in Hong Kong, that will be the propaganda U.S. uses to get all of its allies to team up on China. So this is uh, unfolding every week. It gets more and more violent and destructive in Hong Kong. China urged the U.S. to stop prov provocative acts in the South China Sea after two U.S. Navy ships sailed near islands claimed by Beijing. Meanwhile, this gives you a figure of a feel for how important Hong Kong is. This is where they're raising capital for their companies. 
And with Alibaba's gigantic raise coming in, uh, it will make it as uh, large of a amount raised as the NASDAQ. Not as big as the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ combined, uh, but still, this is really their key central hub for getting capital from the outside world, which they desperately need at this point in time. Uh, plus, they threw an extra, uh, I think it was $180 billion or $280 billion into their 2018 GDP print, although they have admitted lots of fake numbers from all sorts of government agencies. Their trick is they'll take a piece of land, flip it to a real estate developer for a huge profit, and he'll flip it to another guy for a huge profit, and they never allow the price of this property to go down. And so uh, you get all these big numbers, but according to their stats, they hit the 13 trillion mark for the first time. Way to go, China. U.S. has approved some companies to resume tech sales to Huawei, and Trump is considering exempting Apple from his tariffs. What about other U.S. firms which cannot get relief? Trump's government's chaotic trade policy is causing serious business discrimination. There's your photo of Hong Kong. I mean, if your adversary wants to provide the financial infrastructure for you to buy the world's finite real estate or real assets, talking about commodities, for literally pennies on the eventual dollar, why stop them? On the current course, before long, we will have to print USD to buy CNY to buy commodities. And so <clears throat> this is in response to Jeff Snyder, who's talking about uh, whether the dollar could be dethroned by the renminbi. And he says, no way. 90% of all transactions are done in the dollar. It's not even close. It's a pipe dream. Uh, but Luke Groman, who came out and said, well, maybe that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to take advantage of the euro dollar system to convert CNY into dollars and then to buy commodities, which they've been doing at massive pace uh, and perhaps trying to monopolize that market. Fifteen U.S. senators demand President Trump halt Huawei license approvals. Bottom line, China's lower trend growth has two key consequences going forward. First, global growth is probably more resilient to a Chinese slowdown than markets assume. Most of China's slowdown is likely behind us. In addition, as manufacturing capacity migrates from China to other emerging markets, those are likely to grow faster and make up for the Chinese slowdown. Second, China will find it difficult to grow out of its high corporate debt that at 155% of official GDP is one of the highest in the world. Now, if you take unofficial GDP, it's more like 250%. And this doesn't even take into account all the money that all these emerging market countries owe China, which is tremendous amounts of money. So they are really strung thin. Here's your alternative GDP below 4%. and just gives you a, a figure for how fast their GDP has been crashing uh, after the financial crisis and all that money was printed, we went from 12% GDP in 2010 uh, to potentially uh, below 4%. And that's using the alternative GDP figures. Microsoft granted a license on November 20th by U.S. officials to export mass market software to Huawei. Looks like Microsoft's been buddying up with the government quite substantially. We've got Bezos pissed off about a huge... Uh, cloud deal that they just signed worth billions of dollars. Uh, so very interesting. I'll have to look into what that's all about in more detail. And meanwhile, we have no confirmation of this, but China invited U.S. trade negotiators for more talks in Beijing. Last time they flew all the way out there, went to some swanky uh, restaurant. They wouldn't do anything, and we got mad and left within, uh, before the day was even over. So it was more of an embarrassment. This is from Je Jeffrey Snyder. Uh, talking about whether the yuan will uh, overtake the dollar. And he points out that at least 90%, sometimes 96% of all Forex trading and all, pretty much all transactions are denominated in the dollar. So the chance of that happening is very slim at this point. The U.S. has the upper hand in the U.S.-China trade war, which allows it to decide when to end the trade war, but far from enough for it to decide how to end the trade war. The U.S. side wants both, then it needs to change 
to an adversary. So China wants the trade war to pretend like it never happened and to just shake hands. I don't think that's going to fly. Um, most people in the world can see insanity of Hong Kong rioters, restraint of the Hong Kong police, and Beijing's respect to Hong Kong autonomy. But U.S. lawmakers have gone blind altogether. President Trump needs to sign the bill using Braille. Okay, now we're over at U.S. Business News, and this uh, raised a few eyebrows, a little bit of a pullback in the Fed's balance sheet, but that's after it went straight up at a faster pace than we've ever seen in history, and it is going to continue going up. We're just seeing a little difference in the overnight repo, uh, slightly abiding, uh, which is their goal. Their whole goal is to put up this huge repo uh, short-term lending, which they have at different time lengths, and then as they buy $60 billion a month of treasuries for that to slowly uh, take the pressure off the repo market until they can close that down, so they say. And this is expected to go until at least the second quarter of 2020. So we have uh, 60 times eight months at a minimum uh, of balance sheets increasing. Now, could it just kind of stay flat as that dies down and the 60 billions uh, bought each month? Maybe, but maybe not. We'll see. They're predicting now at the end of the year, we could have another uh, dollar shortage and also in April. So those could be two moments in time where the banks are strapped for cash, uh, but it does seem like the Fed is aware and ready to put the dollars out for that to, uh, to not become a big deal. Congressional sources tell me the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act has been delivered to the White House. We are told the president is expected to sign the bill. Uh, now, we're not seeing that is actually happening, so that might be fake news. Uh, Bloomberg, a baby bond bear market and cyclical stock rally is what Goldman Sachs sees in 2020. And of course, that assumes we get a phase one trade deal. I would agree with that because we're doing massive printing and that does seem to stimulate the economy, at least for the short term. Bridgewater bets $1.5 billion. The market will crash by March. And again, that's about a 1% hedge. He's still obviously long. Uh, SPY in emerging markets are his biggest positions. U.S. market manufacturing in the U.S. went up 51.6 and 51.9. So we still have this opportunity. If Trump does shake up emerging markets, all that money is going to flee to the U.S. You get your dollar rallying, you get all these other countries devaluing their currency, and you get your government funded for cheap. So I think he's highly motivated to raise the tariffs if he doesn't get a hell of a trade deal. Also keep in mind the next Fed meeting is December 11th and 12th. So if he does want another rate cut before February, the following meeting, uh, it's now or never. He's running out of time. Maybe he waits till after Thanksgiving to stir the pot. Um, I noticed that he didn't want to stir the pot around the 4th of July, and that's the only month we did lose money, but he waited till August to stir the pot. So perhaps, uh, and maybe he waits till January. So the big, the big timelines to worry about is the Fed meeting, December 11th. Next, the December 15th tariffs, are those really gonna go up? And then from there, will there be additional tariffs? Or will they delay the tariffs? The debt is growing faster than the economy. It's as simple as that. That is by definition unsustainable and it's growing faster in the United States by a significant margin. So that's the big problem. That in itself explains why the Fed must continue to lower interest rates and buy up government bonds. If they don't, the yield will spike and everybody's gonna flee from their uh, low yielding treasuries. So that's why we can count on what the Fed will do. They're just going to do it as slowly as possible. And the bigger question is, what are we going to do when they get to the effective lower bound of zero? So we'll see. They have all kinds of plans in their latest FOMC meetings. U.S. equities account for well over half of the global market, currently at 63% of the value of the stock market is in the U.S. index. And the U.S. only represents about 25% of the total world GDP. So it just goes to show you uh, how important it is to be invested in technology companies that have a good legal system. you got a great legal system over in Europe, but you don't have the great tech companies. 
you got great technology in China, but you have a terrible legal system. So that's why U.S. continues to be the best bet and dominates the market valuations globally. <clears throat> why are bond funds dumping triple C's, they're calling that triple hooks? Do fundamentals matter again? Um, and we'll look at that chart in a minute. Here's all the hedge funds not doing so hot this year. Uh, and out of this huge list, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven funds who've outperformed the S&P 500. And they're investing in some wild shit like Russian Prosperity Fund. Super risky. Uh, meanwhile, where are we on the list? We're at 15% with 1% maximum drawdown. I'd say we're outperforming every hedge fund on this list in terms of risk to reward. Uh, of course, it's a lot easier when you're trading small capital compared to billions. Uh, but this just goes to show why the hedge fund industry is dying and why so much money is flooding into the S&P 500. The corporate sector has been the main buyer of equity since the market low in 2009. And we can see they love buying back their own stocks as the insiders sell. This trend will continue until rates go up. It's just as simple as that, at least for the top end companies. Now we're starting to see the credit market crack at the worst of the worst rated com uh, companies. We'll take a look at that chart in a minute. Uh, jobless claims starting to flatline. Uh, showing that maybe we'll start getting some wage pressure now. Um, now that would probably be pretty bad. All the businesses, when they're in the economic forums with, with the Fed, all they do is sit and complain about not being able to find cheap labor. That's becoming a big problem for businesses right now. The canary in the coal mine for the markets. Canary in the coal mine doesn't look like it's coming out alive. The yield on the CCC, triple C rated corporate bond, has suddenly surged to 11.6%, even though yields for the broader junk bond market have been stable, not good. So here's your triple C going up about 126 basis points in, from September low to current, signaling potentially some risk in the credit markets. Uh, Disney, now this I put up just to show a few companies really dominate the world markets now. These huge multinational companies like Disney, Microsoft, Apple, they have such an unfair advantage. These triple C companies have to pay 11% interest while Microsoft is getting negative yielding bonds in foreign markets. So they're getting paid to borrow money and buy back their own stock. So uh, we can see in this chart, Disney is uh, dominating the film industry this year as they do most years and it's just in general we're having a world where the winner takes all and everyone else just either gets bought out or goes bankrupt now what's neat about the spying stuff it's automatically recalculating who's winning who's losing uh, for you so that you don't have to do all that work and research yourself and that's why the spy has grown from 140 billion dollars in assets under management when I started this program to 260 billion uh, just a few days ago. Okay, now we're into the political news. What's going on with the impeachment? It looks like the House will file papers next week uh, and we may be at the Senate by December, January. And now the Trump team is saying they can't wait. So John Bolton is teasing that the backstory is coming that nobody knows about what he has to say. Um, Bloomberg is getting more vocal than I've seen them in terms of attacking Trump. Uh, Bloomberg politics, hush money, obstruction of justice, defamation, a porn star payoff, insurance fraud. Can't keep all the Trump investigations straight. We built this handy interactive guide. Attorney G General William Barr says he had suspicions about the death of Jeffrey Epstein. Now he's decided it was just old-fashioned incompetence. So now they're trying to jail the two uh, security guards who quote-unquote fell asleep. Bunch of BS, if you ask me, who is actually getting covered for probably a bunch of people. Uh, the more I learn about this, is his, his game was to uh, get these uber-wealthy rich people to come have sex with underage people. Uh, children and to secretly videotape it to gather blackmail. The first time he was let off, 
they said that he was part of the intelligence for the government and that they can't touch him. So who knows exactly what's going on here. Uh, but it was interesting that so much had just been swept under the rug on this story and everybody was getting outraged. And now they came and put two people in jail, uh, the security guards. White House backs full Senate trial if House impeaches Trump. Uh, here's a screenshot from the Drudge Report with its headlines. President steps up the charm offensive as impeachment looms. So he brought in uh, a couple Republicans who are expected to potentially turn on him. Uh, Mitt Romney, a few others, and was talking to them about what all they want to pass. And they seem to have come out with a smile from that meeting. Trump backs the full Senate trial. Trump, def this from Wall Street Journal, Trump defenders have no defense... Donald Trump's impeachment defense hangs by a thread, but can it hold? From Bloomberg. Obama administration trying to keep 11,000 documents sealed. This is relating to the bank bailout from uh, the 08 crash. This was the biggest bailout to bankers ever. They recklessly lent money out to people who could not afford houses. And then when no one could buy, uh, pay their loans, they got bailed out. Should not have happened. Elizabeth Warren, universal child care, universal pre-K, invest $800 billion into public schools. So this is who Bloomberg's competing with. Meanwhile, Bloomberg wants to do the opposite. He wants to outlaw smoking cigarettes outside, wants to balance the budget, um, you know, so wants to do green. He's big on the green. He's very pro-China. So I don't know. I know he's got, he's the ninth richest American. I presume that a great deal of his wealth is not in stocks, unlike every other billionaire out there. They have this fake wealth that they can never cash into dollars. But Bloomberg is a private company, and he's become the ninth richest person in the world uh, from Bloomberg. So he has a ton of money to spend on this campaign, and we'll see what he can bring to the table and if he can compete with someone like Elizabeth Warren or Pete Buttigieg. California can't force Trump to release tax returns, state Supreme Court rules. Now, Trump continues to say that he will reveal, reveal his tax returns and that it's going to show he's richer than anyone else thought. Um, so we'll see. Forbes article a while ago was estimating a $2 billion net worth, but I think he's claimed more like 20, so it's, it's not clear. Um, Officially on the calendar, the House only has eight working days left. In that time, we are told lawmakers will drop impeachment papers. They have to deal with the budget continuing resolution that funds the government through December 20th, which I believe they passed. And we will see how UM, USMCA fits in. Looks like Pelosi is using that as a bargaining chip to, get, uh, to ensure that she has everyone to vote for the impeachment on the Democratic side in the House. Continues to drag that out. Uh, which would also be a huge win for Trump with a huge amount of jobs created. If Democrats impeach Trump, that means Senate would hold a trial. The first people to stand the trial would be Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. The list goes on and on. And on Fox News, Trump was out claiming there's a big conspiracy that's going to be unraveled uh, revolving around the Obama administration and high ups in the department. Uh, spying on him illegally, uh, which is also what we've seen from uh, the Overstock CEO who quit the company, sold all his stock, and went into Bitcoin and flew off to South Asia after trying to tell everybody uh, the corruption he'd seen in the, in the Republican Party. Buttigieg blows Biden away, pulls ahead on predicting poor Joe couldn't even say a sentence in the last debate without stumbling, reversing it, it was embarrassing. I think Joe's out. Uh, although he's still polling decently, which is interesting. Lindsey Graham requests full transcripts of Joe Biden's calls with Ukraine president. Giuliani explains the massive pay-for-play Soros Ukraine scheme facilitated by U.S. diplomats. Top White House officials and Senate Republicans agreed that a full trial should be conducted if the House impeaches President Trump. 
Every time the Trump administration meets Speaker Pelosi halfway on the USMCA, she tries to move the goalposts. The Speaker literally has not even updated her own talking points since Valentine's Day. Textbook obstruction. Billionaire Mike Bloomberg officially enters the run for president as the greenest platform. So he's big on uh, trying to create uh, a green America in terms of cleaner energy. Everybody's talking about a $15 minimum wage, which of course will cause a whole bunch of layoffs if that were to occur. Put pressure on inflation. It would really cause some problems with the economy and you know, maybe get that Fed to raise those rates finally. <clears throat> House Speaker Nancy Pelosi just told me the ball is in the administrative court on USMCA to put protections inside the deal. Out of a meeting with USTR Lighthizer, he told the people, talk to me because I don't talk to you. He also would say if the trip to, Ch he would not say if the trip to China is in the cards yet. And we have the official Michael Bloomberg files paperwork on Thursday to run for U.S. president as a Democrat. Here's a look at the spy. Set to go much higher with the phase one trade deal. Uh, if we do not get a phase one trade deal, what level might the spy sell off to before rebounding? Uh, think about it. If we do fail to get a phase one trade deal, Fed's going to cut rates. They're going to amp up QE. It'll be a short-term sell-off uh, is my expectation. So we'll be playing the momentum to the downside with the inverted option caller and then ready to buy the dip. Um, so I'm guessing uh, either this support level or this support level is a pretty appropriate uh, potential uh, buy the dip opportunity for us uh, after shorting it with the inverted option caller. On the other hand, we get a magical phase one deal. My new target is to, to travel towards 330 before we start to figure out, wait, what's happening with phase two? So that's kind of what we're looking at. Also, the phase one most likely would involve rolling back tariffs, uh, which would be very bullish uh, for the world trade uh, as well. TLT has to travel higher. If we get a phase one trade deal, I expect a sell off. But the big picture is that we're creating more debt than we are growth. And as long as that trend continues, if we want to fund the US government, we must continue to lower rates and support the bond market. As, which is exactly what the government's, uh, the, the Federal Reserve is doing right now. And their main partner in this is JP Morgan. So JP Morgan is the primary dealer buying a huge percentage, by far the most of all banks, of US Treasuries. Then they're taking those Treasuries and selling it to the Fed, literally days and weeks later, which technically they can do, but if you look at the Fed's own statement, it's supposed to be very old Treasuries, not brand new Treasuries. So who knows what kind of profit they're getting on each transaction, essentially a risk-free trade. Um, so if you're wondering who's doing the repo madness, most likely it is JP Morgan. And from there we can ascertain who they do dealings with uh, in terms of where this money eventually is flowing. And we'll take a look at those charts as to who I suspect are the most likely uh, banks in trouble that do have connections to JP Morgan, one way or another. Uh, okay, emerging markets, we get a trade deal. This could break past that 52 level uh, that we saw in 2017. So nice gain in the books for us on that end. On the other hand, if we cut off access to capital to China and get the rest of the world to do the same thing, this could go below that 2016 crash. And this was from the, the big 2015 slowdown. So that's the kind of crash you can see in emerging markets all on their own, just screwing things up completely on their own. Imagine how low it could go if the U.S. really put sanctions on China, uh, started restricting capital flows to, to Chinese equities. Uh, the list goes on and on as to what they could do. GDX, the big picture is that it is much bigger problem in terms of debt in 2020 than it was in the 2008 financial crisis. And you can see the levels that we got to uh, as quantitative easing and zero bound rates were in effect. So I think we will blow past that level on GDX in upcoming years. We gotta be patient. We have two of the ingredients in light. Uh, you know, we have light QE, 
if you as assume that that repo market's not going to go on forever and it will eventually subside, um, we got rates going lower, so we just need some fear now for gold to really take off. LQD is the investment grade bond fund. As long as this is at high levels, your Microsofts and Apples will be buying back their own stock at record pace. It's just that simple. So until this crashes, we want to buy any major sell-offs in equities and, and be brave and confident that the corporations will continue doing what they're going to do. Now here's your HYG, uh, your junk bond. And it's still trading flat despite this news of this triple C's selling off, which is not part of this bond. Uh, and you can see it still looks relatively healthy. Not as healthy as LQD by any stretch. And this really mimics your Russell 2000, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Here's your Russell 2000. So again, it's not in the same shape as the SPY. SPY is really dominated by your Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon. Whereas the Russell 2000 is really your, your mid-sized business in America. And so those companies have much higher costs to borrow, which gives them such an unfair advantage against the big corporations who can essentially get free capital. And now they can afford to go uh, create products and sell them at losses to take over markets. Um, so it's a huge disadvantage for these companies. And this is Stanley Drunkenmiller's favorite indicator for predicting the stock market uh, is whether or not this can break out. So if this breaks out above... 173, we might have a full throttle bull market ahead. But as long as it stays in this range below, it's showing some serious weakness in the US uh, overall equity market. Okay, so who are some banks potentially at risk? HSBC, certainly. Uh, they've laid off 10,000 people, their CEO got fired. They were trying to prop the Chinese currency with the futures market, lost a fortune on that. And you can see it's selling off. So we're keeping an eye on this bank for a canary in the coal mine. Uh, Deutsche Bank is down 90% in the last 10 years. And if it goes below six, many experts say that they could be uh, bankrupt and a systemic risk to credit markets. SoftBank is the partner to JP Morgan with WeWork and also with Uber, which are losing money left and right at a rapid pace. So I, I do think a lot of the repo uh, madness is tied to SoftBank. Um, so we'll see if they can keep their private equity strategy working where they take these tech companies, they do tiny raises for it at very high valuations and then try to IPO it for massive profits. I think this strategy is coming to an end as we get near the end of this uh, cycle. And then Santander, this is a big car lending company. And I can tell you for sure, they are handing out car loans to anybody who uh, can stand up straight. They don't care if you have any income. In fact, I know a guy who crashed his car in a DWI, had no job, and went to a car spot the next day and walked out with a brand new car so he could start a new job as an Uber driver. So that's how bad it is. It's a lot like the housing crisis, but much smaller market. Something like $2 trillion, but it's not guaranteed by the government like the uh, college uh, market is or the housing market. Um, so this could potentially be a company at risk. As we're seeing, 25% of the uh, worst loans in the car industry now starting to default. So that's definitely worrisome. Meanwhile, the dollar continues to stay extremely strong. It just tells us what's the big picture. Emerging markets are having a hard time paying off their dollar-denominated debts, so they have to print money, convert it into the dollar to pay these loans. Okay, there's $250 trillion of debt out there. Almost all of it's denominated in dollars. And so uh, if you listen to Jim Rogers, his prediction is things are going to get rough. The dollar is going to go much higher into a bubble, and then that will be uh, when it pops. So we'll see if it's any time soon. And the last time a, a country tried to really butt heads with the U.S., it was Japan, and we saw what happened to Japan. So now it's China, um, and I think China's about to have a lot of pressure applied to it. Um, here's your 10-year chart just to get a feel for how high it could go. This could go way up to 120. So if that happens, 
uh, emerging markets will crash significantly, especially their bond market. Okay, so crypto is down considerably. This is the same play as gold as far as how I evaluate the macro picture, and it's still very bullish. Unless we uh, really stop printing money and lowering interest rates and can see growth at a better rate than debt growth, this is going to be stuck in the same situation where we have to continue lowering rates, printing money to avoid a crisis. Um, here we are at the CNH. Every time this ticks up considerably, there's been trouble in the stock market very shortly after. And so we're starting to see it tick up a little bit after having sold off considerably uh, from the high in September of 7.2. So in our boot camp, we're looking to short this currency, but we, we got to wait a little bit longer uh, because if they do roll back tariffs, this could strengthen probably back down to 6.8. Um, here's the big picture. It's been weakening for the last two years ever since the tariffs were imposed. So if we continue these tariffs and escalate them, it's quite obvious what will happen. This will uh, sell off and weaken. Uh, gold's having a little bit of weakness over this crackdown in China, perhaps, or maybe the tiny sell-off in the balance sheet, uh, but the big picture remains the same. Central banks are buying up gold at record pace, and we want to own the gold miners while gold's so elevated. So we're just waiting for the next fear factor. Now, keep in mind, I have a very tight put option on GDX, uh, because I know if a phase one trade deal happens, this fear factor plays the opposite role, and I would suspect uh, spot gold could sell off considerably, as well as GDX. So we're protected against the downside. Uh, but if things do uh, implode here, we'll, we'll get a nice profit from GDX and a big profit from TLT. Oil is still trading at a healthy range. Again, if it gets too expensive, that creates inflation fear, bad for the bond market. If it gets too low, that signals that there's low demand for oil and that's bad for growth in the stock market. So between 60 and 65 is a great range for us right now. Uh, the 30-year German bond is probably the most important yield to focus on. The lower that goes, it could potentially move what the Fed believes is their effective lower bound, which gives us a hint as to when this, uh, this big bubble is going to pop. As soon as we get to the effective lower bound, they have no more ammo to continue growing the bubble. And here's your big picture of the German yield. You can see it's in a downward slope and getting ready to tank back into negative territory. And so the U.S. Uh, is not in such a negative slope, but it's very correlated to the German moves. So uh, if we can look at the German yield, we can get a pretty good idea of what's coming our way. All right, guys, that's a wrap for today's video. I do want to mention if you're a YouTuber watching this, you can get one free month into our $10,000 bootcamp program when you join our advisory today. So if you want to continue the education, really learn how this works inside out, and make sure you get all of our trade alerts, call Dean to reserve your spot today. That's 505-322-7515. He'll give you a walkthrough of how the program works, answer all your questions, and get you signed up right now. So call Dean at 505-322-7515. We'd love to have you join the team.